Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Unlaced Podcast. Not just any episode, might I add. It is the 100th. This is the 100th episode. Somehow we've made it. Somehow you guys are still turning up. So I appreciate you. It's been a bit of a bumpy journey, but we've got here in the end and absolutely stoked to be doing this show today. Um, A lot of stories, a lot of history about the show and hopefully many more memories to come. Um, As I always say, if you are new here, thank you for turning up. Please give us a like and subscribe. It's how we grow. And if you've come back again, I absolutely love you. Uh, If I can pause you there, go on the Spotify page. Give us five stars if you're feeling friendly. Uh, It's how we get our page growing up. It's how we're going to keep coming up. And we've got a little bit of a spin today for the 100th episode. So um, my good friend, Sebastian Gotch, who some of you, if you are historical listeners of the show, he was on the show, I think in the first 10 episodes and um, had a great cricketing journey, has a a strong AFL heritage with his family and was a good footy player as well. Um, But he actually suggested to me probably like episode 20, episode 30, he's like, why don't I come on the show and interview you? And I never really wanted to do it. I never really felt comfortable doing it. Never really wanted to gloat or talk about some of the stuff that I've been through in my career. So um, anyway, Braden, the producer, Seb, the man himself with the idea, we decided the hundredth episode, we're going to do it. So we flipped the script, Sebastian. Here we are. Here we are. 20th episode. You reckon I mentioned it to you and 80 episodes later (laughs) and you give me about 12 hours. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You've uh, you've put the pressure on me, mate, but I think it's going to be good. You've known me since I was eight years old. So some would say you've had a 22 year preparation. Yes, correct. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff I've I've got down. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, a lot of stuff you had to um, delete as well. I'm sure uh, that'll be that'll be happening. Don't worry about that. But it'll be it'll be good fun, Jake. I think the people deserve to know a little bit more about you. Yeah. Well, so also a, lot, a bit of this is um, a lot of the listeners as well have have been asking like, the "Fuck am I?" Or mm-hmm. you know, did I play soccer? Or you know, because I, I don't really like talking about it. Or I haven't spoke about it and stuff. So uh, part of this is for you guys too to hopefully understand a bit more about why we do this show. Um, some of my experiences and maybe why I can hold my own with some of the athletes of some, some of their conversation. Yeah. Prove a point, mate. Pro- well, Prove because I point. understand them, I guess. So yeah, give some context to that. Well, it's interesting you say that. I think this is mapped out very openly. There's nothing, there's no pressure here, <laughs> Yes. but I wanted to know you've hundred episodes is a big deal. Like big. it's a lot of time into this. And I know there's a lot of people that try the podcast set up and they don't, they might do 10 or 20. You've done a hundred. What were you trying to achieve through doing this? Well, it actually comes a little bit back to soccer, which we'll probably touch on, but I kind of ended up, like, even though there was a lot of circumstances, I probably felt like I gave up a bit. So I was like, if I'm starting this, there's no, like, I'm going to do this till I die. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to give up is yeah. what I'm trying to say. So, um, like the perseverance aspect was probably never in doubt. It was just more, it's more been like, how do we grow it? How do we strategically make moves and think outside the box to get like guests that, you know, Braden and I have had in the van that we probably had no right to have uh, conversations with at times because of like where we're at, we're not paying the money. Um, so yeah, that with some of that, like there was, I think there was one period where I did probably like 30 episodes before I might have jumped ship with Braden because I had some different producers before where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to keep doing this because it was like, it's quite hard when you do it by yourself as well. Like I, I envy the podcasts that have like a mate or a yeah. co-host Bounce and it's ideas. just them mm-hmm. because half the job is like finding guests. Mm-hmm. And obviously when you're trying to find the supreme athletes in the country, their schedules are pretty hectic. So then you go, Hey, can you come on my podcast? So like, Oh yeah. Can we give you money? Well, probably not, yeah. you know, cause we don't have budget for that. So that was the hour issue, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gotchi was asking for six figures. So, <laughs> um, yeah, which, which we don't know where it went. It went missing somehow. Yeah, correct. It came in islands or something. So, yeah, yeah. um, but yeah, so with all of that, like thinking of that, I kind of pinched myself. I was like, I'm very happy we're here, but at the same time, I'm not surprised. Are you, where do you go from here now? Like you've, you've done a hundred. The challenge is getting people back and telling a different story each time. But what's, what's the plan as your focus shifted from what it was at zero episodes to a hundred episodes, are you still trying to do the same thing? Well, I think it has because definitely when I started it, I was like, I want to talk about like the other side of the athlete and athlete transition, things that I'd struggled with um, and things that I'd experienced and that I'd kind of learnt that actually like, every athlete goes through at some different point in their career. Like you've obviously been through, been through a lot of similar things, in fact. Um, so it started off like that, like a bit heavy, like mental health focused on like athletes and stuff. And then- I don't know what happened, but it ended up just turning into like being like a bit of a comedy, like 
comedy show intertwined with some of that stuff, intertwined with like the recipe of why people are successful, yeah. like into just random ass stories. Like um, today I got a message and this is Braden, this is genius, was Ben P and Jack Jenkins. Like we've, we've done, we're talking about some random stuff with random people. Um, but Jack Jenkins came on and told a story about how a fan told him um, like he went, he, Jack Jenkins, sorry, for those who, who don't know what I'm talking about, he's a UFC fighter. So he was going to the Dana White Contender Series in America and over there you're fighting to win. Uh, and if you win, there's a chance you might get a contract to the UFC. So if you lose, you're not getting one. If you yeah. win, it's a maybe. It depends on how you win. And Jack was fighting some guy from South America or whatever and this kid from Perth who has been like, he's quite young, like a teenager maybe, maybe a little bit older, he messaged Jack randomly, got a like, message request saying like, hey, mate, I've gone like deep into South American media. I found like a lot of, a lot of shit on this guy. Yeah. Um, he's lost one fight in his career and it's when he's got his like above his eye cut open. So he's like, if you get him to the ground and you hit above there, I think his like, eye's going to come open. And Jack's like, yeah, all right, cheers, mate. Anyway, so Jack remembered it in the fight, in the contender series, cut the guy's eye open and beat him and got a contract to the UFC. And like, obviously Jack did his own stuff, but yeah. that moment actually happened. So Braden cut that clip up and it's got like two and a half million views. And then today, when we're shooting this, I got a message from Ben P, the kid. He's got the UFC have called him for an interview before Jack fights, um, oh, right. you know, Jack's upcoming fight. So it's like, yeah, pretty cool. Like shit like that is now happening. So it's yeah. like, it's kind of becoming into its own stratosphere of possibilities, I think. What do you, what's more important, getting someone that can tell a story of what they've done or trying to get those guys that are about to go into something new? Um, I think it was probably for the first hundred, it was trying to get like big names because it was trying to grow the platform. But definitely the most enjoyable podcasts, and I think the ones where people get the most benefit from, um, are the ones where we have like a like a really powerful story, or even just some of the guests who can like speak so well. Yeah, um, it's pretty cool. So, what about your story then? Because we've known each other for a long time, yeah. and um, we don't deal with our emotions well. So we don't <laughs> no, talk about. That's our why emotions. sport was good for us. Correct. It was our way of <laughs> take it out on the other blokes. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> we ignored the issues. Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen as much now, and I think this platform opens up. The communication channels. You've had some some really interesting athletes, but sort of professionals as well in that mental health space. How do you feel? I've got a long list of your career here and where we we went from and where we are now. What does your career look like for you going back to the start of I don't really want to touch on your your junior stuff, you know, mm. you were a natural soccer player, but talk to me about going into the the Ollie Roos, making your way through the A League. Yeah. How was that all mapped out? Well, or probably like it's quite for some, like I always joke when I, when I stopped, I think I retired professionally at like 21, 22, yeah. but I always say to people, like I was playing senior football from 14. So like, I felt like my body, I felt like I had like an eight year career already, but so it kind of started from 14 when I was, I was still in school here, but I was on a part-time scholarship at the VIS and the VIS was like the bracket for that was like 16 and 17. So I was quite young. So I'd train with them and I'd play like VFL reserves for a team. And then one day, like I, I don't know, I had a bit of a monster tournament, which Jamie McLean spoke about for this club where I dropped back like to my age group. And the tournament was, if you won, you get to go to Manchester and play in the Manchester United Cup, or you get to go in the playoffs for it. So we were playing, like we had absolute legends, these guys, but they probably weren't the best players, right? <laughs> and well, <laughs> the, the, some of them I see out now and they still get around me for this tournament. Like they're like, ah, it's crazy. But um somehow we won the semi-final, I scored a couple and then we played the final and the final we played against Green Gully, which had six players from the state team that I was captain of. Yeah. So it was like me versus all of them. And in that team was Jamie McLaren. He's, he was captain, like all these other really? guys, like oh, I had some great players, man. And I don't know, they, maybe they had an off day, but I, I scored these two absolute worldies, like goals I couldn't score again. Yeah. And then we went to penalties and we won on penalties. Um, and so from that game, the head coach of that club was there. And this moment changed everything. Head coach was there and um, he came in the changes after. He goes, you're playing with me this weekend. I was like, what? So he played me in the senior team. And like this team, Altona Magic at the time in 2008, they actually won the, the whole league. Yeah. So it wasn't like a shit team. It was yeah, like the best the team. Yeah. yeah. So when I, when I got a gig, I was like, fuck. So I played 15 minutes. I don't even think I touched the ball. I was so nervous. Um, and then I was, I was actually in that moment that I was the youngest player ever to play in the NPL. Still? I think, I think they, 
like it's six months after and they played another kid yeah, right. who might have been younger. Yeah, yeah, but anyway. So I but I there'd be no one mate, there'd so. be no one near me and him. Yeah. For example. But anywho, so the ne- uh, next day I went to the VIS for training and they got wind of what happened and they said, Oh, you're not going back there, you're on a full scholarship. So um I ended up going back into the same like they played in the reserve grade. I went and played there with them and then played a sort of another tournament for the state team. And then that tournament I went to for the state team, which was a national tournament, which were pretty much all the cream of the crop were going going to, they picked the next uh, generation of the Australian Institute of Sport Athletes. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think I had that good of tournament. Like some of us probably didn't have a good tournament that got picked, but they must have known us from before because yeah. we didn't play good that time. We came like fifth or sixth. We should probably should have won it. Um, and, yeah, so when I went there, that's when my sort of national – um, or institutionalization, yeah. I say, yeah. of my uh, brain began of, of the football game. And that's where I was like all, all in. Um, that's when the young national teams obviously started coming because you're in that sort of bracket of the best in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, that's that's where it really began. Moved, left Melbourne at 15 and moved to Canberra. I remember you always as a soccer kid. Like we weren't at school much. You were doing <laughs> your own thing. A lot of it was training, wasn't it, during yeah. the school hours? Yeah. I had a letter from uh, – Jim Alexiadis, the principal. Oh, really? Yeah, giving me uh, can leave Tuesday and Thursday at um, recess or lunchtime to go to Darabin to train. I had the same letter, but I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had this letter so I could just walk out of school. That's I was like brilliant. 14, you catch two trains and a bus. Do you look back then a little bit, like this soccer period of your life, it's gone for a couple of years, really, mm. professionally, and you put so much time to that development stage as a, as a kid do you look back and go, geez, I'm, I'm behind the eight ball now. I've got to go into this next phase of my life. And a huge part of that learning phase was put into sport. Yeah. Yeah. That's why probably I was in a hole for like two, three years. I don't know. Did you go through it? Like having like the identity crisis? Still there. Yeah. You're still, yeah, still there, yeah. right? Yeah. Like even now, man, it's like I'm definitely past it. And I think that the strengths that come from being an athlete are now uh, helping me be good at what I do now. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, just like, you need like a lot of emotional intelligence. You need like, I love this word, mental fortitude. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Cause you just like so much stuff's going on with high pressure. So a lot of that helped, but at the same time, like, like you, you were exactly like me in school because you were pretty good at footy and cricket was like, I was Jake, the soccer player for like 10 years. Like everyone, even like, oh, Jake, the soccer player, he's cute. Or Jake, the soccer player, he's a wanker. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like it was always associated with what I did. Um, so when I came out, I was like, fuck, what do I do now? Even though I was like part of my own doing, cause I was just, I couldn't face the game and stuff. I just, yeah, really fucking lost. Yeah. Like you'd probably still see me have a smile on my face, but like behind closed doors, I was like fucking fragile. Yeah. Cause yeah, it's just, I used to get, I still, to this day, I say like my alter ego on a soccer field or that confidence that I had on a field, I've never resembled in any other walk of life since. Yeah. You reckon, you reckon you can find it? Probably. Yeah. I think so. Like I'm starting to really, I'm starting to really like doing this stuff Yeah. and it feels very natural, but like in regards to like, I mean, there's a competition on like podcast charts and stuff, but same time, I think it's like an uneven race. Like mm-hmm. if you come in with 300,000 followers and yeah. you're a footy legend, you're going to jump straight ahead of me. You might not yeah. be a great podcaster. So it's hard. Like the competition aspect is where I was like stepping on a field, believing you put in the work and you're going to beat everyone on the field. Um, which you can relate to, and most athletes probably can relate to that. That feeling of this is what I miss the most. Yeah, I think your your effort gets noticed in sport. Mm. Like your performance is always it's at the top. Yeah, you know if you're playing well, people are coming up to you, patting you on the back. But in this line of work, you can be doing really good things, maybe not reaching as big audience as you once were. Mm. But I think you forget that that impact is still super important. Like those that some I've watched a number of the shows, listened to them, and they've resonated with me quite a bit. I was going yeah. through a pretty tough period um, coming out of sport and they helped me personally. So that yeah. satisfaction level and your happiness and the drive that you used to get from sport, I think you need a, a little pat on the back as well for yeah, what you Yeah, I appreciate now. that. Do you know, it's funny you say that because I've started probably the last three weeks or four weeks, I've started getting people like messaging me like not necessarily that I'm helping them or anything, but they just like tell me they love the podcast. And every time I go back to them, I'm like, they, they remind me of why I do it. I can sound stupid, but I was, cause there was a period there. I'm like, fuck, are we just like shooting, like shooting at air, like here with darts or something like, you know, because we were getting like views and TikToks and the numbers are slowly climbing, but like we weren't getting, it didn't feel like we were getting engagement and might, maybe that's on my end, but 
now we're getting to start like people reaching out, like random people messaging me on my Instagram, not just the podcast Instagram, yeah. saying like, love this episode or da da da. Um, and a big part of that's with Braden as well, because he's so smart with the clips and the angles that we push mm-hmm. that some of those clips then bring like listeners. Yeah. So, which is obviously why we do do the marketing strategy that we do. Yeah. It's exciting. I, I don't want to divert too far, but I want to talk a little bit more about A League. Mm. Um, I used to sit on the couch with mum. Mum would scream <laughs> anytime you got the. She didn't really understand soccer, so when you just got it. Do touch. people know that? Um, oh, people probably don't know, but obviously, yeah, the A League journey's kind of split up and stuff. But when I played most of my A League career in Adelaide, I lived with your dad and your brother. Correct. Yeah. So how, this is the other reason that? why I was fitting. That was fucking awesome yeah. because it was like, like, yeah, because of like, even though Adelaide's a small town, it was like, um, I realized that because I was still a kid, Mm -hmm. so it was like a family feel in a house. So I still felt normal because before that I'd lived at the AOS by myself, like in a hut. And then I'd gone to Gold Coast and lived with like four guys and I'd lost like what a normal life like a kid was like. So that was good from that perspective. And obviously for those that know your family, they were like footy nuts. So your dad was coaching South Adelaide, Dave was playing for South Adelaide. Oh, your dad might've been with Port then. I think it would have been Port, yeah. Yeah, it was Port. Yeah. So like we didn't speak about soccer, Mm -hmm. which was mad. Cause like it was so intense at training. So from that angle, it was really good. And then, um, I think your dad came back to, I don't know if he's, he left, or he, but then Brett Eddie came in. So then we had like uh, one for one. Yeah. One for one. So then we <laughs> had, so it was really, swap. it was a good experience off the field. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Well, in saying that, what was dad never really spoke to me about sport either. So it would have been a nice setup for you, but yeah. what was Sean like? Um, very much like your dad yeah. and no, what not actually, actually probably. Yeah. Same because so. My dad was cricket. He was a cricketer, like a good cricketer. It's like a famous story well, of how he tells us it was good. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he, he's got a famous story of he was playing for the Vic under 19s. He was going all right. And back then, he used to go play in the lower leagues in England if you couldn't like play for Victoria. But the lower leagues back then, you'd have like Brett Lee opening the bowling in like yeah. the early 90s for like a team. He'd be a pro or like a West Indian fast bowler or whatever. So it was like a decent league, but he went over with Shane Warne. Yeah. And they bunked together for six months in this like little shitty town up north in Accrington where Warney played just before he got picked for a show for the first time. He played a season there. My uncle was his captain, um, which is what's so funny. Um, but my dad met my mum there. And so he came back here and obviously you, you had the tutelage of my uh, father at cricket. Yes. And he was like, fucking, he was like, an, I can't say that word, but he's, he was fucking nuts. Like yeah. he was relentless. Like your shirt was popping out of your, your trousers from like yeah, fine yeah. leg. He would, he would scream at you. Yeah. So there was that aspect. And then from the cricketing front, like he would bowl balls to me and make me play front foot blocks because you know, I was very defensive because <laughs> he was trying to build this thing. Like when he gets bigger and he could start playing shots, like no one could get him out. Yeah. So from a kid, I would just block and block and defend and move my feet and position and duck and wear all this sort of shit. And he'd make me play the same shot over and over again. And I'm getting to your question, but um, I remember once I got sick of it and I was like, fuck this, I'm just going to smack one. So I smack one. The next boy was straight at my head, knocked my head <laughs> off, knocked the helmet off and I was just like crying and I went home crying. So he was he was nuts on that, but because he didn't know anything about soccer, yeah, he just never said a peep. Interesting. Is and it true? Did he used to take you to the nets when it was just getting a little bit dark as well? Yeah. It was harder to see. Yeah. That's when he really- He openly it. talked. He openly says like when I was on 99 in the backyard, he'd pick up like 10 yards <laughs> and like, yeah, like stuff like that. Like he was just, you didn't earn anything off him in cricket, but soccer, he was different. He was more like, he could see that I was really passionate about it. It was yeah. like my number one sport. And that changed at 12 when I made my first state team. And then I went to England and um, had trials with clubs there. And then I also got to go to a Premier League game and I was just like- Fuck. It's like it's like a kid when you walk to the MCG for the first time. You're like an Anzac Day. You're just like, this is what I want to do. So I had that from the Premier League. Um, and then obviously, I probably soccer was my worst sport. It was probably three. Like footy and cricket were probably number one and two yep. in regards to like my ability as well. Yep. But soccer, I just made the first state team. So that became number one. And then from there, dad was always like the, outs, the outside of parent who didn't know anything about the game, like the Aussie dad, because yep. my dad's white. He's Australian. Um <laughs> And a lot of a lot of them were from like you know Europe or some part where their dads had played and stuff like that. So they used to not stand with any of the parents because he used to not be able to like because they were so intense. So I had to I was lucky in that sense. Yeah, mum, mum, mum was pretty similar. She's just mum's fiery, like she's competitive. So I get all that from her. Um, so no, she was very she was just like a typical mum, very supportive, very loving, very caring. Yeah. But if like 
you wouldn't want to cross her. <laughs> like not not me, like a parent. If she said something like, but she would be fucking straight at you. Yeah. So she she had fire about it, but she was, I don't know, I think for them from 12 to like 18, I just kept achieving and doing things. So they didn't really try and tell me what to do. Yeah. Off topic again, and it's um, a question coming out of left field, but dad being white, mum being black, mm. what, we, we've never discussed it. I don't know the issues <laughs> that you have faced. I, I just thought that things were very normal yeah. uh, in my own little world. What were some of the issues that you faced? Um, I mean, not, not so much issues. Like people say like Australia's a racist country and stuff, but I didn't really, I didn't really cop it that bad um, to be honest. And I think, do you know what? I think a big part of it probably was just because one, I went to a pretty good school. Um, like we both got scholarships to Caulfield. So we're very fortunate in that sense, but also I was good at sport. Yeah. So like that almost outweighed anything. So if I was like doing bad stuff, which I never, I didn't really go through a bad phase because sport kind of kept me on track. Um, I reckon people might have used that against me, but um, yeah, I still had, I still had like fuck moments. Like I had a dad call me a gollywog once on a soccer field because I scored two and like apparently the game before when we lost, I didn't shake their hands or something. So he come on the field and like in front of everyone called me a gollywog and then he got like chased around the field. Um, Goodbye, Sean. Nah, nah. <laughs> I don't think dad, dad didn't hear about it. Someone told him about it after. Um, How old were you? Oh, 13. God. Yeah. I didn't understand what he said. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. And one of the guys behind me is like, you can't say that. I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? Yeah. Gollywog's like a doll. I actually kind of look like on as well. Cause I had the, I had the hair, the soul glow hair, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Then just like basic stuff, like people calling me black, like nigger, um, you know, all that sort of shit. Like when people say it to me that I don't know, that's when I take offense. Mm -hmm. Um, so it happened a few times in school. Like I got two detention, the two big fights I got in at school and I won't mention their names, but one of them probably is one of them like watches the show. Um, yeah, he Shout said, said what he did and like, I just, I kind of just saw red and yeah, got in trouble for it. But it's been pretty good my whole life, to be honest. I haven't really looked at it, but at the same time, it's a very weird space for me to be in when there is racism because my dad's white and my mom's black. So I go to the UK and I'm Aussie. I stay here and I'm black. So it's very like, you don't know like what, what does that mean? Yeah. Do you know? It's unique. Yeah, but uh, to be honest, yeah, no, I've I've heard a lot of stuff that's happened to people. I, I've still cop fucked racism, but I, I wouldn't say it's been as bad as what people would probably assume. Yeah, did you get any of it? I know playing at Adelaide, um, A League, there's a lot of stories of these sports persons getting abuse online and a lot of racial vilification. Mm. Anything like that comes through at that time? Not really. Um, no, nah, not really. I think because you know why? Because I played well. Every yeah. time, yeah. every time I played for Adelaide, I played well. Mm -hmm. So I didn't cop hate. I just was my fitness and the run-ins with people there and all that sort of stuff was what sort of stopped me. But um, definitely like I spoke to Josh Bruce about this as well when he was on. It was like whatever happened on the soccer field um, dictated who I was for that the rest of that week. Yeah. Um, particularly from when I was at the AIS to my last year at Adelaide. So if I played well, I'd be – great bloke not necessarily like in the change room I wouldn't be a shit person but like my parents would call me and I just like wouldn't want to talk to them or if I didn't play well but if I did play well dad would tell me like I'd be happy as Larry like I learned all this stuff afterwards mm -hmm. um but yeah so that I'd, if anything I'd probably more the thing that I struggled with wasn't so much abuse like but I would read things online and it would affect me because I was like 18 to 21 yep. you're like interested you're building your name you've like worked your whole life at it you want to see people like what you do so some of that stuff I used to actually, I used to read it and I didn't necessarily see too much. I used to see it and bother me, but I used to probably read too much of like, oh, that's like, they like me and mm -hmm. worry about it. Um, but I just, yeah, I remember, and I don't even know if I'm answering your question here, but um, I just remember I used to put so much pressure on myself. So that was probably like, that would outweigh anything. I just had so much pressure on myself every game, every straining session. What do you think about, we've spoken about this briefly, but all that negative chat, the Twitter, Instagram, um, the comments that come with that from often 12 year old kids abusing you about <laughs> playing a cover drive. Yeah. Um, I, I like to look at it and identify what they were saying and why they were saying it. <laughs> yeah. And I felt that was my way of being able to go, all right, I can, you would I can write, you'd, be, you'd be the type of guy to write back and have a laugh yeah, at it and like, go on with their jokes. Which was a little bit yeah. sad at yeah, times. Yeah, you're, but, you're a bit different, mate. But I think when we ignore them and sort of we, we think they're happening out there, you get a little bit of anxiety about what could be said. Mm. Um, do you think there's anything in trying to 
cop it on the chin, identify it and then work forward? Or do you like the mentality of just ignoring uh, it? Well, it? if you sign up for social media, then you better, you, you don't have a choice. You're going to have to identify with it yeah. because like you can't hide from it. So um, I think that's part and parcel. Like I, I would prefer if you didn't have to see it, but if you're up on, you can't, like I've literally, you don't choose what you see on social media these days. So yeah. Um, so that's why, yeah, as a, as an athlete and it's funny, Roy Keane said this, who famous Manchester United captain, he goes, uh, he won't understand why professional athletes will go on social media. He goes, you've already got that much pressure on yourself. Yeah. Why would you add another layer? Big baby. Yeah. Big, big baby. baby. So, yeah, which is an interesting point, right? But yeah, I think if you're on it, you just got to identify with it. But that, this was all pre, like Instagram just kind of came out. Like, so I didn't really, it wasn't that bad. Get us back on track. Um, go back to Adelaide. I know there was a lot of stuff that happened in that time. What was the hardest thing dealing with it then? Because obviously you're away, well, away from your family. Well, yeah, it was, it was a tough place from like a career standpoint because, so when I went into Adelaide, I'd gone in, this is on the back of Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. So Gold Coast, the club that I was at, I played the last eight games of the season. They signed me as a 17 year old from the AAS. Um, I had two like big games against them in the youth league and I've had a big game against Melbourne Victory as well. My, my pri like primary choice was to come back to Melbourne and play yeah. for Victory. And I remember I got told we were playing at Amy Park against Victory and I got told to like, have a good game today, you know, because the coach is watching. Ernie Merrick was a coach. Yeah. It's like, all right. So we did. We rinsed them 4-2. I scored a penalty, set a goal up as well. Yeah. It's like a really good game for the whole team. The whole team played well. And then I remember we got a phone call after saying, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll offer you a trial. Um. Yeah. And then I played against Gold Coast and I rinsed, uh, it was just in a f like good good bit of form. I, I won player of the year that year, which was a big, big like achievement to win that. Because the year before when I started the AIS, I was like in the bottom half of the players. Yeah. So the second year, then I won player of the year because yeah. I just changed a few things. It was a big moment. But the game after Gold Coast, they just bang, contract straight away, offer. Um, so back then the mantra was like, go where you wanted. And I was like, fuck, all right. We went there, which was the worst decision ever. Um because there's so many, so many reasons about it. But to your point, I, I got signed to Adelaide off the back of like eight or nine games in the A League, where I did really well. The club we played, they played young players, and like I think we were the last team to beat the grand finals, Perth Glory. We didn't, we lost one game in eight. We did really well, and then I went to Adelaide and I had a preseason there because they were tr tr uh, preparing for the Asian Champions League, so they didn't stop because that that runs sort of right in, in the off season. Yeah. So I went right through, went straight there, moved in with your family. And I was, I hit the ground running. I was full of confidence. So I was training the house down. Um, and then it would have been like two months. We qualified for the Asian Champions League. We qualified out of the group stage, which means you can bring in a new set of players. Um, so the group stage was ongoing. So once they qualified for that, then I, um, yeah, I was put in the Asian Champions League squad and um, preparing for that. So I was like doing really well. And then I played the first few games of the season because I was, I was, the coach had a, a really good opinion of me at the time, John Cosmina. Um, and then I, d I, ha I got osteitis pubis after like probably f round five or six, which fuck knows what that is. But what it's is a that? bloody... I that stopped. Yeah, man. I, well, I don't know what it was, but it was like, man, I just like, in my pubic bone, every yeah. time I ran, it felt like there was a brick in there and Kicking I couldn't turn. As well, or just... Run. Yeah, some movements was like, wasn't there. Some movements were incredibly sharp, but yeah. like you could see my movement wasn't like right. But the problem is it's like, you get like, it's like a, can be a six to 12 month injury. Um, it was like an eight week thing at the time or something, but yeah, you couldn't move and stuff. So I had that, uh, that, that first season was pretty tough because I, I came back and played four or five games fully, fully healthy um, and had really big games as well. Like the, there was a man of the match. So it was my first goal in the A-League. Um, so I had some good moments coming into the back end of the season and they'd, Michael Valcanis had come in as the coach for Cozzy at the back end of the year. So I was hopeful he was going to stay as the coach um, because I was in his sort of favor. Um, and then, yeah, so I kind of underachieved that first season because that injury ripped me, like, ripped me apart for the sort of middle of the season. And then being a young player, you kind of need some runs on the board to get, get into the team that we had. Um, but I didn't really have any at the club other than just some good appearances and like the kids good in training type stuff and he plays for the young national team but like that's you got Dario Vitasic, Karuska, Sama Malik, Isaiah, so it was a fucking good team. Yeah. Um and then there's a funny story of when this the, the second year was with Joseph Gombao and things looked a bit um high on life. But I went to the camp now in Barcelona. I was watching a game with my dad. We we're in Barcelona the last game of the season in La Liga. And ten rows in front of me, we're like nosebleeds. Ten rows in front of me, I see 
um, the football director of Adelaide on the phone. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I called him. I'm like, I wonder if he picks up. He's picked up. He's like, Jake. I'm like, Pachillo. I'm like, Michael Pachillo. He's the football director now at Melbourne City. I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, I'm here to sign the new coach. I was like, no way. So he was there signing Joseph Gombao, who coached at La Masia, which is where Barca's academy comes from. So he coached right. like Fabregas, PK, like all these players. Anyway, he got wind that I was there, and the guy took me around like Barcelona for two days. We went and watched a player that we were going to sign, Sergio Thirio, who ended up winning the grand final for Adelaide almost. Um, or he did. And uh, he took me to a Barca B game. So he had been, he had told me, he's like, I've been told that you're going to be my type of player. Like the way you play is going to be perfect. So I was buzzing yeah. coming into season two. Um, and then pre-season, man, he just was after me. Like there's so many funny stories. He used to grade us like out of 10, how we'd play in games. And so, like I'd score, I, sc- I think one game I scored one or two. Just to you or to? No, to everyone. Great. And he would be like, I'd score, you score a couple, you think you played well, and he put like four out of 10. And he just fucking rip you apart. <laughs> and anyway, got with me. Like I never said anything, right? Because I was like, I'm trying to win this guy over because yeah. I know he's good. But it got to a point where like some of the older lads were like, "Hey, stop fucking going at Jake." Yeah. Like literally, two two of the and the two of the players that did, I don't want to say their names. They got they got they got club got rid of them. Kidding. Well, not because of that, but yeah, like but it's, it's coincidental, there, isn't yeah, it? Right. Yeah. So they had their own issues, and then they just went at him. So it was a really hard preseason. Um, and he wanted me to get fitter because the way his system was is like high press. Like if you don't have the ball, you win it back in the first 10 seconds. So you're sprinting. If if you don't get it back, you're kind of holding. But like as soon as it's near you in your space, you're gunning at the guy. And then when you got the ball, it's like high volume movement, rotations, two touch with the ball. So everything's very quick. Mm-hmm. So I just didn't have the, the engine at the time. So I could miss something to work on, but also it was like a new style. And then we had a, we had a really good – we, we had a really bad start to the season with him and he, he sort of um, had a lot of pressure on him because the, the system was taking a while. We weren't winning. Everyone was like, we were like, be patient because we could see it in training. It was working. Yeah, media jump on. And just, well, yeah, this started the catalyst of my demise was um, he got into a run-in with a journalist, Val McGlatch, his name is, from The Advertiser. Yeah. Fucking prick, right? <laughs> this guy used to just hammer hammer people and like he, did, he was a bit salty at times he's kind of nice to your face and then you just read this article and he just hammered you yeah. like that I didn't have any any of that none of that happened with me yeah. but everyone else was like fuck and I could just see shady guy like you know what I mean yeah. but anyway in Val's defense what happened here it was pretty untoward um he because he was writing these articles on the coach like coach should be going it's not good enough blah, blah blah this team made the finals last year all these players like young players including myself in the team they should be doing better yeah. we've got like some of the best players in the country and the coach just went off at him one session. It was like, I heard your son was a goal. Ke- I heard your son's a goalkeeper. I heard he's a shit goalkeeper. Like the coach said that to him, like real spiteful. So this guy gunned for the coach for ages, right? And I was playing off the bench for like six or seven games. I was in this role where I couldn't stop coming on and making an impact. Like, cause I was like, that's the only way I'm going to start. Yeah. But he kept me on the bench because one, the players were doing well at the start, but it was like your impact. Like I would just, I'd come on 80th minute and I come on 70th and I come on 60, then I come on like 50 yeah. and like make an impact. And then, um, yeah, finally, um, finally I got a start. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of where that season sort of curtailed for me after that game really. Hey legends, just a quick break in this episode to thank our partners, Dabble, the gambling agency, where you dabble socially and gamble responsibly. Please only bet what you can and are willing to lose. Now, Dabble is one of the great platforms out there. I absolutely love using it. Very similar to Instagram where you can follow some of the head honchos in the different sports, copy their bets and get some good wins on the board. Now, Fortunately for me, I've been working with Dabble for over a year. This year, we are doing a stream every Tuesday night. It's called Jake's Take. It's from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. where you can go in the Dabble app. You can join me. We get guests on every week. We bet on the dogs. We have an absolute ball, and they're talking about sport and cutting up the shop around what's going around town across all codes. So come on down, check it out. Dabble socially, gamble responsibly, and let's get back into the episode. Playing for Australia is a big deal. Um, obviously, super important. And playing against Del Piero would be pretty special. Like, yeah, you, you would have been a kid growing up watching him, and yeah. then all of a sudden you're marking him. Tell me a little bit more more about those two things. I want to. Yeah, well, playing for probably like I still have him around to this day. I think I might have even given you tops. Like, I used to love giving my mates tops. Yep. Um, yeah, because I remember like one of the my, probably my proudest moment in my whole career was playing for Australia, even though I wasn't the Socceroos playing for the young Socceroos and the Ollie Roos. 
like wearing that, playing against overseas, against other countries, had the honor to captain um, the Young Socceroos in Japan at a, at a really sort of big tournament. Um, like they're things that I still vividly remember. Like I still remember standing there, listening to the national anthem. Um, I remember I got a red card against Vietnam. I remember scoring, scoring a double um, in Indonesia in front of like 40,000 people. Yeah. Um, like so many cool memories. Obviously my, probably the, the thing that sticks out most is, was making the under 20 world cup squad. Um, because I was not in any of the previous teams before that lead up and they played all these practice camps, games, and they went to the Asian cup at the time we just got moved into the Asian confederation. And this young Socceroos team was so good that they made the final and it was going to be the first Australian team that could have won an Asian trophy. Wow. Um, because yeah, the Socceroos had failed at the Asian Cup. Matildas hadn't sort of weren't on the weren't where they were now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were the first. Well, this group was the first team. So it was like a fucking good team. Everyone's like, this is a golden generation, and we they ended up losing to North Korea, who were unbelievable. Believe it or not, I think. Um, but I had that good of a season in the AIS that I just got picked into one of the camps, and went one of the camps we went to Holland and Germany, and bro, this story's fucking insane. So we go to Holland, we go to um, Germany. And we're doing, no, we do a training camp in Holland and um, we play at this tournament uh, in Tobork, which is like, it's like 20 minute halves, but the greatest like players in the history of the game play at this tournament. And I'm talking like Boca Juniors, Liverpool, Man U, Real Madrid, Ajax, like all these teams are there. And we're the Australian under 20 team and we played them. And like, so this was my first taste of international football and like, Man, we played some incredible players, but I remember reading the manual before and it was like, player of the tournament, like 1990, Cafu. Player of the tournament, like 1999, Steven Gerrard. Like yeah. this, some of the greats have been yeah. there. So this was like my first experience. I was buzzing. I'm playing for Australia. Anyway, I didn't play that much in that tournament. It was like a bit of like a show thing more so than a real thing. Interestingly enough, for the Socceroos fans out there, I opened the manual. Two years before we were there, it said player of the tournament, Australia, Aaron Moy. Really? And I was what like, you with that about uh, this was 2012. So Aaron Moy would have been like 2010, 20, yeah. 2009. Yeah. So it's like, fucking Aaron Moy's a baller. Yeah. Right? This is how good this guy is. But anyway, then my debut for the Young Socceroos was in Dusseldorf and we played Germany. And I was marking, I think, Emre Chant. Wow. Yeah, Emre Chant. He played for Liverpool, Juventus. Big yeah, big boy, man. I remember once he like bodied me and like flicked the ball over my head and just like chested me out of the way and got it back. I was like, fuck. <laughs> um, but amazingly, right? So this is when I said I wasn't in the picture for this World Cup and why it was such a big achievement. I played a good game that day. We, we won 1-0. Mm. And in that midfield was me, Terry Antonis, and Mustafa Amini. And we were all 18. So we were like, we were eligible for the next World Cup. So we put, put the young kids in and we'd like, we swam. You know, we didn't sink as such. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> played through the tournaments, um, trained really well, and then got the phone call when I was in the Gold Coast, driving to training, saying like, you're going to the World Cup in Colombia. And I was like, holy fuck. And I never forget my agent goes, who would have thought that? And I said, me. Yeah. I said, I thought I could. And I was just, that's the type of, like, that's where I was. Like, yeah. that. this is why I say it's str- I struggled when I came out because I was just, that's how I, my head was. It was so driven and believed and like all positivity, no negativity could get in. And then went to the World Cup in Colombia. In Manizales was our group. We got spanked, but I had a great time. Um, and like that experience to this day, like I still have all the tops, like was probably the one of the greatest experiences ever. And that's also was like, you can play, like the players we were playing against were like signed for Real Madrid, signed for Liverpool. Um, so I kind of knew that like, I'm not that far away. Like even though I'm in the A-League and there's a big gap in level, like, this is my opposition now. It's not fucking, you know, Kiel or Park or Oakley or whatever. It's like I'm playing the playing the best young players in the world now. So that was like a tick of approval of like you're on your way. Um, and then what was the um, the other game? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right. well yeah. Sorry to to go to the point um, to tie into this game is what I said before though that tor- that tournament that World Cup it was out of three people to get picked in my position. It was Tom Rogic, Massimo Luongo, and me, and the coach picked me. Tom Rodgick, like now has probably made like 20 million bucks from Celtic. Yeah. He's a soccer legend, been to like World Cups. And then Massimo Luongo, I think he's been to World Cups. But when we won the Asian Cup here under Ange in 2015, he was player of the oh, tournament. Man, yeah. So it was like, it was, it's just a great selling point of like, when you think you're going well, like things can change. But also like that was, that was where I was at that point. I was yeah. in that position. So, um, 
yeah, and then then the next phase of that was um, where it gets like a humbling experience when you think you're on top of the game and how things can change quickly, which is a bit of a life lesson, was um, the week leading into the Sydney game, I told you I played like eight or nine games off the bench. The coach come over to me and he's like, Jackie, he's like, you're in this week. And I'm like, oh, he's like, he's like, yeah, but you, you've got Del Piero. Like you're going to have to mark him because – I think um, Marcelo Kowalska, who was a fucking unbelievable footballer, he was injured. So he had to miss this game. So um, I was nervous as hell because Del Piero was at Sydney. Like the league was paying him, not just Sydney. Like he was getting a check right? from like fucking somewhere to keep him here. Like yeah. he was a marquee, but like there was money coming from wherever because marquee's outside the salary cap. Yeah. Um, and like Del Piero I watched in 2006 when I was in my first second state team. He scored a he scored a goal in the semi final or whatever it was, to put Italy into the final. He won the World Cup with Italy. Yeah. And then he'd won a Champions League with Juventus. He'd won the CDR. He'd won everything, right? So this guy's a god. So when we came, Adelaide's got a big Italian population too. So when he came to town, there was a section of the crowd that was just wearing Juventus tops. Like they were there to watch him. And it was like packed stadium. And I'm thinking, fuck, man, I've been off the bench eight games. The one game I start is the biggest game in Adelaide for yeah. the whole year because Del Piero's in town. So I'm like, fuck, don't fuck this up, Jake. So anyway, I played, played all right, but what people like forgot it or didn't, didn't really know much about me was like, I was really good, not really good, but I was just very confident, but I would always take set pieces. Like I'd always take free kicks, which isn't, um, it's not like untraditional for young players to take set pieces in teams, but there is a fucking pecking order. Mm -hmm. Like I defy anyone to tell you that there isn't yeah. like best player takes everything. Like, do you know what I mean? Even if they're, even if they're not good at it, they can, they can have that pool. Yeah. But um, we had a few plays out that day. We still had a good team. But anyway, we got a penalty. And I remember, like, I used to never miss penalties in training. I don't know how, but, like, it came down to me and Awood Mabil, who's a soccer now, to take the pen. And Awood was younger than me. No, no one. And then I remember Johnny McCain going, come in, broke it up. He goes, J it's Jakey's. And I, I took a penalty and scored. And fucking on top of the world, we're winning 1-0, playing against Del Piero. I kept Del Piero relatively quiet. Yeah. Even though, like, there was periods of what he did in the game. And mind you, I'm bragging. Del Piero was 38, 39. So I was like, fucking, so I should. But he was still magic. Like, he would, I'd touch him like that and he'd drop, get a free kick. Like, just so smart. Like, it wasn't soft. It was sprains. Yeah. Like, he knew how to caress the system and just magic feet. But he went off. And then they scored a fucking equalizer with eight minutes to go. And it was 1-1. One, one. And I just remember thinking, like, my parents were there. Such a big moment. Like, I was, like, really proud of myself. Um, I was getting interviewed by Fox Sports after the game. I was walking off. I was thinking, fuck, like, how good is this? Yeah. You know? And then I tell people, I'm like, but that was my last professional game ever. Never played again. And what happened? Why did um, so the foot injury, they didn't get re-offered a contract at Adelaide. And then it got to a point where my agent at the time, like, fuck, it was really tough. This is the mental strain. Like, he was trying to get me to clubs. Um, I didn't play the back end of the season. So some of those games that I was playing wasn't necessarily as fresh as in people's memory. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it got to a point where like he actually asked me to call the Brisbane Raw coach at the time, Mike Mulvey, because Mike Mulvey was a youth team coach at Gold Coast when I was there. And he was the one that when he got promoted to the senior coach, played me those eight games at Gold Coast or whatever it was. So um, he asked me to call him and I was like, fuck, I'm 20 years old, man. Like, should I be calling a head coach? So I called him. Like, this is fucked when I think about it now. Yeah. Maybe people could do it if they have a relationship, but like I didn't feel comfortable doing it. And it was the main reason why my dad's like, no, we're not working with him anymore. Um, and I was just sitting on my couch thinking like, fuck, what do I do now? So um, the only, the where it kind of got a bit interesting was um, I reached out to someone who knew a guy called Andy Bennell. And like Andy Bennell to me is the greatest human ever because when no one had my back, um, he called me and said, mate, like, come, he's like, are you able to come to Canberra? And I said, yeah, like I'm getting over this foot injury. Like I should be ready in a few weeks. He goes, I want you to come to Canberra and stay here for like a couple of weeks. And I'll just, you're training with me. And Andy Bennell was like a socceroo played in the, played for Reading. He's a legend, mm -hmm. but he's most famous for, um, being David Beckham's because he played in Spain, David Beckham's, uh, English to Spanish translator when he was at Real Madrid. Really? Famous for it. Wow. Like, yeah. Like it was his right hand in Madrid, but he's from Canberra. It's so weird. Yeah. So anyway, he was, he was like dabbled in the football agency because he had connections everywhere. Um, he had a boxing gym and Birch, he's like a bit crazy. Yeah. Like he'd leave foot marks on people and like he kind of wouldn't blink and like he's a bit, bit, bit everywhere, but he's involved with Central Coast now. He's a good guy. Um, so I was training with him. I hadn't trained for six months. I'd taken the back end, like I'd taken such a big layoff with my injury. 
And I remember this is one of the sad things as well that happened, but I got a call to go to Western Sydney Wanderers. Tony Popovich is a coach. He's like, come on trial. And I was like, fuck, Birch. I'm like, I've been training for like six days. I've had like f- after four, three, four months off. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ready. And he goes, we called Popper and Popper goes, well, if he wants to be here, he'll be here. So I was like, fuck. So I paid my own way to Sydney. Luckily, Daniel Mullen had a spare room, an old Adelaide teammate. Went and stayed with him. I went to training and I was like, fuck, man. I just bounced in straight away. I was just hit, yeah. hit the ground running, trained really well. And I thought, fuck, I'm on here. My old AIS goalkeeping coach, uh, Ron Corey was there and he goes, because we had a game against a Canberra team. So I had to go back with the team to Canberra. Um, and he goes, man, if you just like play all right, you, you, you're going to get a contract. So he said to me, and I was like, fuck, all right. Because Ron's known me for years. Yeah. He's like 71 and just like great goalkeeper coach. But he, um, he told me that I went there and I remember playing and I just remember the soccer ball feeling like a golf ball. Like I just couldn't really see it. I couldn't move well. Through nerves? The no, that you knew what maybe, was maybe, maybe, but I think it was more like, man, I've had four months out of the game and I'm, my first game back is like a fucking trial match against not the greatest players on a shit pitch, which sometimes is harder. Um, and I didn't, like I didn't, I, no, I did shit. I did terrible. Um, but the thing that fucked me mentally after that was that I played so bad that the coach didn't even tell me if I'd made it or not. Like he just, just silence. So I went back to my hotel and camp, not knowing what happened. And two days later I called Ron. He's like, yeah, I was unlucky mate. Like, but like the coach didn't even have the decency to tell me. It's ridiculous. And I'd paid my own way there and stuff. So yeah. I was real salty at this for ages. Now I've like run into popper at victory and stuff. It's a bit different, but, um, yeah, that, that was really hard. So then what we decided to do, and this is where to answer the question of people like, why'd you stop? Um, is I went to the UK on my British passport and I trialed it. I was there for six months. I'd wake up every day, train by myself, come back and play PlayStation or go see my mom's family. Like it was pretty yeah. fucking sad, depressing shit. Um, it was like, it was like Santiago Munez in goal. Like so yeah. I was just, I was just trying to get in this weird place. I didn't have friends. I didn't speak to anyone. I never spoke to a girl really. Like I just fucking didn't know what to do. And all, Andy Bernal had a mate there who's lived in London, who was an agent of Ryan Edwards, one, one or two Aussie plays over there. And I was just waiting for him to call me to get it. Like here, one share, here, one share. I trialed at like six clubs, I think four, no, trialed at five clubs. <laughs> one trial ended because the coach got, done doing coke in a bathroom. Oh, so that was like a league two team. So that, that ruled out. Yeah. Um, then Reading, um, Blackburn Rovers and who the other team was, I don't think Reading and Blackburn Rovers, they both pulled me in and said, you're as good as what we've got. Like yeah. you're a good player, but we've same level of kids. Um, cause England as well, right? The market's fucking, it's like yeah. AFL there in every town. They put money into G. Yeah. So well, yeah. God, they, so from eight years old, we've been training this kid. So why would we pick you? So I was like, fuck, fair enough, which was a hard pill to take. But again, I'm like training by myself. I'm not match ready. I'm not fit. Like I'm trying to be as good as I can. So I'm like, I feel like I'm against the eight ball, but the closest I got was at Oldham athletic where they were about to offer me a contract. Cause I played and trained well, given my life to it, man. Like I would go home and like vomit and stuff. Cause I was like, so so exhausted from like the games or training. Mm-hmm. Um, and he offered, he was going to offer me a contract. And then last minute they got a guy from Aston Villa on loan, which to be fair was the right decision. The guy scored like eight goals in eight games. Yep. Um, so I didn't sign there and I just kept getting like close, but not there. And it was just like fucking kicking me. And I'm like, how much longer can I stay out here? And then I went to Hibernian where a few Aussies are now and did my knee. Um, like had did some sort of like, I don't know, MCL or something like that. And I had to come home. Um, so I was gutted. Like I was at a low point. So I was like, how do I enjoy the game again? So I went to play MPL for a year yep. and I hated it. And then after that, I stopped. So that's crazy. Yeah. That's to answer that question. Cause everyone always goes like, why'd you stop then? I was like, well, yeah, I fucking went through hell and back, man, just to try to get a gig and then came here and I just hated it. Like didn't enjoy it. It was like a chore. Yeah. How did you, how did you deal with that? The next sort of 12 to 24 months, where yeah. were you? What were uh, you doing? Well, it was like back to that, not, not like I'd already lost myself mm-hmm. like as a person when I was in the UK because I was just like mentally all over the shop. But yeah, here I, I, I was like, man, I was like drugs, alcohol, I was going out, I was traveling. I was doing like all the things that I couldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, just to escape, well, escape the feeling, but also be like, well, fuck, I'm free. Like I'm actually free as a human being, but like fundamentally I like wasn't happy. Like I was in a bad, bad spot and I don't know, honestly, I think just time healed it, but it was like 
two, three, four years, like I, I didn't watch a soccer game. I couldn't face it. Yeah. Um, couldn't see my peers doing better than me, doing well, even though I wished it for them. It fucking hurt me, man. Mm -hmm. Like it just fucking hurt because I was like, that's where I should be. So I kind of pretended I never played sport. I pretended I'd never played soccer. Like I took all the soccer. You probably even see it now. There's no like, I think I've started posting recently, but I had all these posts of me playing for Australia. Like I took, I deleted everything. I deleted every post because I was ashamed to be like associated with the game and not hit what I, everyone believed I should have. If you were in the exact same position now mm. and those posts were there, you know, the photos on your wall were still up, would they stay or would you still take them down? No, I've, I'd, oh, I don't know. What I, what I would do if I was 21 again is I would just be like more patient. Mm -hmm. Like you've got more time than you think. Like even if it's, even if it doesn't work out, like don't give up. Yeah. That's probably what I would change. So that's the probably bitter pill to say. That's why I'm so adamant. I, whatever I do now, I'll never give up. Yeah. But yeah, it was fucking hard to admit that for a while. You build some good values now though. Yeah. Like pretty you're pretty good. resilient. Yeah. Well, you'd hope so. Fuck. It's quite special. I think when you look at the sport, I know watching you, when I used to watch you play, I got excited at the thought of you doing well mm. in whatever it was. It could have been, you could have been playing badminton, you could have been doing chess. Yeah. Like I just loved you succeeding in what you were doing I and that, that hasn't that. changed for me now. Like I love watching you do this. Oh, so your identity to me is still someone that works hard and, oh, and cool. does the right things. So yeah. don't uh, worry about how we see you. <laughs> yeah, I know why I did. I don't now. I couldn't give yeah. a fuck now. It's what's funny. But bro, for a while, it's like, man, this sucks. Like even just my own fit opinion of myself mm -hmm. um but yeah with time and i could fuck it was the best thing that's ever happened to me bro yeah be the best it will be or is like literally because it's invaluable that experience what i got and like when i go into like like my job that i work for a tech company now like fuck man imagine like um like a guy in the boardroom goes to me he's like well, what, like, what do you know about leadership jake like, captain australia yeah <laughs> like fucking pretty Look valuable and like do you know what i mean like you're still wearing it <laughs> do you know what i mean though yeah. like and right you've got some credibility and like as, as you know like walks of life people love athletes that elite thinking and all that sort of stuff so yeah and then we led into the podcast and then now we're here so yeah. do you think about it a lot still is it enough time out of the game now to have got over it yeah, or do I've you over it. yeah do you wonder what could have been yeah, yeah, because a lot of the players I played with, and you know, they, there's a reason why they're there, and I'm not for sure. But at that time, it was probably better than that are playing for Socceroos. And it was but, strictly you put it down to that. There was a bit. There was a bit going on, wasn't there? The hip. The oh forward. yeah, my body, my body, yeah, and mine too. But yeah. but mine was the mine came second to the body because mm -hmm. like I like my intentions were always I wanted to play at the highest level, I wanted to achieve. But like I just had a lot of setbacks. Five coaches, three years. A lot of like had a hip hip injury, which ended up having to have hip surgery on. Um, and then I had like all these like inflammation in my joints, which is what I played with in that last season in Adelaide. So I think I told you the other day, I used to wake up in the morning. This is like when I'm coming off the bench, like, so I'm going all right on the field. So this is why I thought not to say anything, but I used to wake up and put my foot on ice because I couldn't walk in the morning. I had to wear like these big heeled shoes just to get to the car and get to training. And then I get back to the training ground and put up my foot on ice again because I felt like there was a rock in my foot. Yeah. If I flexed my toes up, it felt like it was ripping. Um, but then as soon as it would warm up and I take some painkillers in the boot and I put my boots on, like I could, I could mask it. Right. I could get around. So I did that for like 10 weeks. Um, and then I went away with the Oli Roos after the Del Piero game and I was like, I can't fucking move. Um, and they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it was. They were like, there's so much fluid there, but we can't see a fracture or anything. Anyway, I found out later in life, it's like two years ago that I've got like a form, mild form of arthritis. That's crazy. So like I couldn't like, cause joints were like swelling up, like my hips, everything. I was like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Um, and I never got injured before I turned pro. Yeah. Never. So were you, were you for, like, were you still loving playing when you were going through those injuries? A lot of travel living away from home. We're loving the game at 20, I, I loved it. Like f under 20 World Cup, Oli Roos, periods of Adelaide. I loved it. The back end of Adelaide, when I came back from the Oli Roos um, camp, that's when it started to get messy because um, one of the things on me was like your foot injury. I'm trying to get that right. I was like training. Um, so what happened was, is when I was playing these eight or nine games, um, like going back to the preseason, Jossop's biggest knock on me was like, you're just not fit enough. Like I can see the skill with the ball and all that sort of stuff. That's fine. But you need to be a runner where you play in this team, like first and foremost. So I had to get my running capabilities up. So back then, um, Darren Burgess was like, 
the, the yep. guru. Like he'd, he'd spent time at Liverpool, he'd spent time at Socceroos from a sports science perspective, and he was at Port Adelaide um, at that time. So I got in touch with Darren Burgess. I was like, mate, like this is my name. This is my situation. Like I've heard about you. Like is there anything you can give me or can I train with you? Like essentially, please. Yep. Um, and he goes, thanks for your message. He, he put me onto this guy. I can't remember his name. And I'm so sorry if this person's watching. I think he's Steve. Anyway, it's, it's a great story for this guy in the end. But so he put me onto his understudy from Port. So I used to go meet this guy from Port twice a week and do these running sessions with him. This is the whole time I'm like coming off the bench in this period. So it was kind of good because I wasn't playing full games that I could do a bit of extra work with this guy. And I got fitter and fitter and fitter. And then played the Sydney game. I remember the guy, the guy who trained me was like, how good is this? Like we made some inroads, like blah, blah, blah. It's getting interviewed by Fox Sports, all this shit. Go away with the other years, come back with the injury. And bang, the, our boy from the advertiser, Val, got wind <clears throat> that I was training with this guy. And Val still had a fucking chip on his shoulder from yep. what Josep said. Wow. So he unleashed this article saying Adelaide United not fit. Um and we were starting to win. The, the, the season was starting to turn. Yeah. But he, like, used me as bait. Like, Jake Barkadash has been that, training yeah. with this guy, da-da-da-da-da. So I'm thinking, like, fuck me. Like, I've only, I've never really been in the advertiser other than, like, if I scored a goal or something like that. But this was, like, an article of, like, this guy's reflecting that Adelaide aren't fit and the coach isn't good enough and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm, like, 20 years old. Yeah. This is why I'm, this is why I fucking hate journalists. Because I'm like that. That fucked my it fucked my life. That yeah. that article, yeah. like, genuinely fucked it, um, and my head as well. Because what happened after, and I don't know if it would happen now, because people are a bit more aware of like how you should treat younger players. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I don't know. I was probably like Jason Horn Francis well, at this time, say, in yeah, the sense of really like, aware, yeah, well, yeah. I was like going through shit like that. Mm -hmm. But the the football director Michael Petrillo and Joseph Gombau called me into their office to talk about it. And I was nervous. I was like, surely they'll understand. Like, cause the instruction was, I didn't tell them what I was doing, but like the instruction was get fitter. And like, it's very, very normal in professional football to have your own trainers like outside and go do stuff one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Like people in the Premier League do it all the time. Joseph Gombau even said it to me. He goes, Javi and Iniesta, they have their own trainers and physios. So I understand, but they suspended me for two weeks. What, internal club suspension? Yeah, it's internal club suspension. For training. So couldn't I couldn't play. I wasn't allowed to play. Um, so yeah, and then I never played again. That's, that's really So that's a fucking, that article. In a sense, like, don't get me wrong, I could have done heaps more and maybe at the start of the year, should have said something about my foot. There's a lot of ifs and buts and maybes, yeah. but f fundamentally that is what changed everything. Do you, do you think there was a build-up of things though? Like, they all seemed like that it was pushing you away from the game yeah, a well, little bit. Was, and then when yeah. an injury comes in, you sort of go... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you know, I can use this as a bit of an escape. Well, they they might have used it as an escape, but it was very personal, like mm -hmm. this this rivalry. Um, so it was uh, probably like three, four weeks after that, Josep came over to me, and I, I probably wasn't in his plans, to be fair, because when I came back, my foot was a bit sore, mm -hmm. but the article had come out at that time, so I didn't really have time to, like, come in and say, hey, guys, I need help. Like, before I could ask for help, there was, like, I was getting suspended. Yeah. So I kind of lost my head. In a sense, because I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like, what, what have I done wrong here? Yep. Like, I've just gotten myself trying to play the style that you got, gotten fitter. Like, this is back then. I'm playing like victim, right? Mm -hmm. um, now I'm like, it's just fucking stupid. But um, yeah, so that was like a really tough time. And then as soon as that happened, they pretty much said like a month after when I started training again that they weren't going to offer me a contract. And then that's when I pulled the pin on the year to like get my foot looked after. Yeah. And obviously things happened. You never came back to playing again. Never really, yeah. Have a, you, lot, a, lot of, a lot of stuff happened after that. But pretty, yeah, that was the last time I was on a contract. Have you have you looked back and actually assessed your career and gone, this is what I did, this is how it ended, or did you just try and um, move away? I think what's hard if I look back and you listen to some people say it now, which is, it makes me happy to hear it because I'm like, fuck, I wonder if people forgot. But like, I, I felt like I was one of the best players in the country for a long time. Like for, as a midfielder anyway, it might sound egotistical, but like I genuinely believed it because yeah. I'd worked that hard. I was captaining the young Socceroos. I'd captain the Oloos. I went to a World Cup two years above my age group. Um, I was like one of the youngest players in the A-League playing at the time, all that sort of stuff. So I was like, there was a point there where it was like everything was perfect. And one of, one of my old junior teammates said it to me, it's like, man, you, you made every single rep team and every sort of representative institution you could have from 12 to 20. And then he goes, when you got to the A-League, you started getting injured and not getting picked. 
and he's like, you copped your first disappointment. I was like, maybe it was that, but uh, I mean, I don't think it was, but I thought that was interesting to hear because maybe it was like, I, it's the first time I had like, I had adversity through my career and stuff, but I'd always overcome it. But this was like, you've got to like, you have to take the other guy out to get a game. Mm-hmm. You might be better than him, but this is, this is a, down to opinions. This is a business. Yeah. Like we've brought him in from Argentina for X amount of money. Yeah. You might train better than him for two weeks, but he's starting because the fans expect to see him. So all that sort of stuff I didn't, I struggled with. Yeah. Like the, the political nature of the game, the business, like the suspension, that was a, like a business move, mm-hmm. like a political stance against like, that had nothing to do with football because what I was doing was just trying to be better for the coach. Yeah. So stuff like that, that's what, that's what, and Rashid went through it too, Mahazi, my mate, but it's just the business made me sort of, it's like, it's not, it's not even a sport anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's still, you still love it and have fun and boys in the change rooms the best. But when you start going through some of that stuff, you see some players, like it changes, like it affects their like livelihood. Yeah. So. Was, was a part of doing all of this, hearing other stories to help you try and figure out that transition period? Were you struggling with going, okay, I was the soccer player, now I'm yeah. who? Maybe I'll ask other people who've been in a similar scenario to <laughs> discover a bit about how, how fun is this? Episode one, Johnny McCain, if he's watching, captain the, or not, he captain Adelaide United, played for the Socceroos, played in Saudi Arabia, played in Romania, had a great career. He played up until he was like 34, 35. And um, he achieved all you wanted in the game. And I told him, I was like, fuck, I came out at 21. Um, so like, you know, I think I said, for me, it was like, it was harder because like, you know, I hadn't achieved what he'd achieved. Like at least when he stopped, he knew he'd ticked those boxes. And I was like, I thought, I believed I could have ticked those boxes. Everyone told me I was going to tick those boxes, but I didn't. And he was like, nah, Jake, he goes, trust me. He goes, it's just as hard for me. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, bro, like I've been in the game for a long time. Now I'm, now I'm essentially like the identity loss thing one, but he's like, day two of that, I've got to provide for my family. Like I have to go and get money and get started and bring this like income in, in the sense of like help build up my future. Like he made enough to like pot around and stuff. But at the same time, he was fucking lost. Like he was like trying to figure out what to do. He's like feeling his days doing random things, go play golf. But like, it's like what people say when they get everything they want and they retire and they're not happy. Like that's essentially what he said to me. He goes, you're 21. Like you've got the world at your feet type. Oh, at the time I was 21. He's like, what he was trying to say, he's like, you have the world at your feet. So. Like things like that was like, oh, that's like glass half full thinking. Like I was thinking glass half empty for like six years. So like little moments like that through this podcast and hearing like everyone's stories and stuff, it's, yeah, it definitely helps. It's kind of like been like a healing process, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we lack it a little bit in just like since I've gone into work, the, the compliments like in sport, if you do well, yeah, it's in the paper. People are calling you there. Mm. They're giving you this positive reinforcement a lot. Whereas when you're at work, like I remember my first week, I'd just turn the computer on and I'd be like, well, that's a great start. <laughs> and and I'd, I'd wait for someone to come over and go, well done, like you're doing the right <laughs> start. <laughs> yeah. And no Control, alt, delete. Correct, <laughs> yeah. And people just expect you in the modern day to just do what you're meant to do. Mm. And I think I really struggled. It might have been a bit selfish, self-obsessed, but I loved that positive reinforcement that you get in sport a lot. Yeah. So trying to was, find those little- It's like the validation. Yeah. But this is what, yeah, my, I think- the validation of like a human was mm-hmm. coming through sport. Yeah. And then this is one of the best things I learned in the podcast, which uh, I can't, can't remember who I spoke to about this, um, but I did have an elite athlete wellbeing research on the show once, like early doors. Yeah, right. Uh, Sam Lane, his name is. I don't even, I didn't even know what that job was, but I'm like, that seems to fit what we're trying to talk about. Yeah. So we spoke yeah. to him. But what I learned from that is that my success uh, in soccer wasn't because of the ball. It was because of me. Yeah. So I'm like, if I put that into anything else, well, the common thread is that it's within me. It's not the ball because mm-hmm. it was like, yeah, I could do it at cricket and footy. So once that trickled over, I was like, oh shit. So this failure can be my biggest success, which is corny. But like at the same time, it was like, now I know like all the things I went through in soccer, all the upset. Like if I can come back from that where I was chips in and I fail at that and I can come back, that's like the biggest, um, biggest victory I, w- I would have because then it's like nothing can stop you. Yeah. Like uh, if that, if I can fuck up at soccer and still be good at life, then I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. That, that took a while to get through, but that's where I'm at now. Yeah. No, so, you're, you're making a name. I want to <clears throat> take you back to the podcast. It's great hearing your story and everything that comes with it. But what do we, what do we 
doing now? Where does it go from here? I know we've got some different plans, but do we want to keep going down this path of talking to these athletes and, and professionals? Do you want to introduce new stories? What can people expect over the next hundred episodes? Yeah, it's a good point. So people might might have noticed that in our bio on socials, it now says humanize the athlete, business and artist. So it was very much sports heavy, but being out of the game for a while, like I listen to a lot of music, I love creatives. So from an artistic point of view, they're, they're interesting to me. And then like we're all involved in business. Um, and like I've got a lot of successful friends in business, got a lot of people that are starting business, a lot of people that business that fail and they start again. And that, that really interests me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're trying to broaden the scope out because a little bit of this is like, yeah, I want to get um, – some of the medicine out of these guys of what makes them great or just insights. But ultimately for the listeners, like they get something from it. Yeah. Um, so that's why that feedback, like the feedback forums we've done before and stuff have been awesome because you realize, okay, maybe like sometimes you get lost in the conversation and just like being here, yeah. but you forget how many people fucking listen to it. Yeah. 100%. Like they're over the journey, the amount of like, I don't even know what we're at from a downloads point of view, but it's a lot like someone in Andorra. Listen to the last episode. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where the fuck's that? Yeah. So that's pretty cool. What was your favorite episode so far? Favorite? Tough. Do you know what I said the other day? I think Josh Bruce is in the top five. Really? Yeah. That one was really good. came out. What? Well, because he just spoke so candidly and raw. Like he epitomizes a lot of what this brand was about and why it's there. And he was just like, he didn't even know what this was. Like he, I said, if you watch this before, he goes, man, I just saw a few clips last night. But the way he came on and spoke and shared what he shared like around getting death threats and like how he literally spoke us through his mindset of like when Charlie Dixon kicked four on him in a quarter. And I was like, fuck man, I respect it so much because I'm like, that's real. Uh-huh. Like when you're like you, when you're probably facing fuck, who was the quickest ball you faced? Uh, all of them are quick. Yeah. but like Too quick for me. Like who'd you face Mitchell? Time Al Mills, Mitchell Johnson. He was very Yeah. Quick, so yeah. when you, for instance, when you face Mitchell Johnson, your head's against the wall. Like no one really asks you what's going through your head. They're just like, oh, Mitchell Johnson got you out. or got you, you know, got a strike. But no one goes like, I'm fucking shitting myself. Like yeah. my life is in question right now. <laughs> like that's what he was telling us about. Like only athletes can know that, yeah. right? So he was talking about that. Um, like obviously love the ones I've done with Jordy because yeah. like Jordy just gets views and clicks. But both times we did it with him, um, like in, not necessarily strategically, but it was by chance that it was just a better time to do it. it was like around periods where he kind of, his name was getting tarnished. And I've, I, why that's one of my favorites because I felt like the second episode, like I reckon, not not me by any stretch because I just showed who he, who he was, but I reckon it helped build his brand back up. Yep. So that was like as a mate, one, that was pretty satisfying to see like people go, like so many of the comments like, oh, Jordy's actually a good bloke. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's always been a good bloke. Like he's never been charged with anything. Yep. Like, you know, people just love knowing if he does something wrong or right or whatever. Like people are so obsessed with him that it gets magnified, yep. you know, everyone makes mistakes but like with him it was that was really nice to sort of see that started to change things actually um then um like i love the ones i do with my mates Uh, i think probably i mean i don't know yeah that's probably probably the ones brain do you have any favorites oh yeah yeah oh yeah we had a dog once yeah kieran stott who's a like oh, yeah, yeah. What ex, was he on? What was he on? Ex, on the, ex on the beach, I think. Yeah. And then, yeah, Anthony is like a boxing coach and boxing promoter for like um, walk, celeb shows. Walk shit the- oh, yeah, he walked shit through Calvin Klein's house. Yeah, because oh, he's a big time a, model. What a Klein There's been so many, man. Honestly, there's there's like little things as well. Like Kelsey, um, Kelsey Brown. Yeah, that, that one was a big episode because I didn't really realize how big Netball was. Yeah. I just know Kelsey is a chick and I'm like, she's so funny. So like, it'll be a funny podcast and she actually sang and performed because she's like a really good voice and she actually got asked to go perform at Splendor in the Grass. So this would be- back of that. No, no, she'd, 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 yeah, claim it. No, she'd actually been asked before she came on. So based off that, I'm like, can you perform? She performed. But that from a numbers point of view, because of the participants of females in netball was so big. Um, I love talking to all the soccer guys that I get to reconnect with, um, you know, that, that sort of stuff's cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. I wanted to get to a point where like, I can literally just like people keep listening, even if I just get my group of mates on. Yeah. Like I want to be able to do that as well. Not just have to get superstars. Yeah. So what do you, that, what do you need from, from the people? I don't think you get to ask the, the question a lot. Obviously the feedback around. I mean, feedback. Yeah. Feedback's number one. Um, one thing Tommy Sheridan does really well, but, um, just keep getting feedback. Like, cause I'm open to the show is for the listener. Like obviously, um, 
we're trying to get the right people on and bring a different side to uh, our interviews in the sense of like, it's not broadcast media. Mm-hmm. Like you can drop, the people drop their guard as soon as they walk in because they feel relaxed and we're not trying to, like a, my, my number one rule based off my experiences with, in Adelaide is we don't talk shit about people. Mm-hmm. Like we never talk shit about people, never gossip. So it's all about building up the person that comes in. Yeah. If they want to, you know, go to a deep and dark place and share something, like we'll go there. But we're not going to like talk shit. So it's not going to be like clickbaity, but at the same time you get the real person. Yeah. Um, and, and real stuff. So from that, I hope that is what's keeping people coming back. You're giving people, you're giving athletes specifically a chance to tell people about them outside of their, their sport and what they do and listening to you talk about your identity and figuring it out after, I think it allows these athletes to go, all right, this is who I am right now. Tell their story, talk a little bit about their past and then gives them an opportunity to start thinking about who am I going to be and who Mm. do I want to be perceived as to, to the other people. So you're doing some. I think you're doing some really special work. It's also, I mean, it's opening up doors to other stuff, which is interesting. Like Melbourne Victory came and reached out and I've been doing ground announcing with them. Um, fortunate enough to work with Dabble, which, you know, probably have plugged in this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might even be doing some stuff with the Matildas at the World Cup. To finish, I know you love asking this question. Resilience, drive, or ambition? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's done it. What's the most important one for you in your journey? Well, it's a good one. And now I understand how fucking hard this is to answer for other people. <laughs> My God. I think for me growing, I think now what it, what it has, what it was, was ambition. Cause that's definitely, I had like huge, huge goals. And I think that really just like drove me that the ambition then drove me and then resilience kind of came through that. But now post football, it's definitely been resilience. Yep. Like I've been forced to like ambition. I'm like, I don't even know what to shoot for sometimes. That's the hard part. So you've had to be resilient of like getting up every day and like being active, like having a crack at stuff. Like, and there's no trophies for that, by the way. But a lot of people do that, right? Like, it's not just me. Everyone gets up, have a crack and like, you might not be rich or well known for it, but like you're fucking, that's a big win. So, uh, resilience. I love it. Yeah. Hundred step, mate. Thank you. Hundred step. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I've. We've, we've been friends for a long time. Yeah. Um, you give everyone else the opportunity to dive into a few things. And I think it was important to, to hear your story. And it's, it is one of resilience um, and it's one of a bit of growth as well. Like you're going in, in the right direction and um, I'm prouder of you now than I've ever been. So oh, thanks, thank you bro. for letting that me was tough, share man. a little that was bit. Hard, bro. That's still fucking hard being a guest, bro. It's I tough prefer work, being, a, being an interviewer. Well, now yeah. you can take that skill and, yeah. you know, 101. Oh, the thank you, Gotchi. Thank you guys at home. Appreciate it. 100th episode. We'll see you next week and we'll be doing 100 more, that's for sure.